You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Little ambient noise, so it'll be fun. Mm-hmm. All right, welcome back to Options Insider Radio, the interview program here on the old network. If you're hearing a little bit of ambient noise, it's because we're we're doing this al fresco out here at the uh, Futures Industry Association a conference. A great show this this week. You'll be seeing a lot of interesting things about it and from it on the network this week. But now pleased to sit down. One of our old friends hasn't been on the network in a while. It's Kathy Clay, the head of global derivatives over there at SIBO Global Markets. Kathy, welcome back to the network. It has been too long. It has been too long, Mark. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Oh, yeah, a lot, a lot going on in your neck of the woods these days. Uh, it was an interesting briefing yesterday. It was fun. A lot of interesting new faces, new voices, new content. I can't remember the last time I heard so much about European equities and uh, Canadian depository receipts at the SIBO briefing. So that was new to me. You know, I think a lot of people, myself included, when they think of SIBO, they probably think of three things. They think Chicago, because it's in the name, and they probably think VIX and XPX. I mean, it was somewhere in that order. Maybe they rearrange it. Those are probably the three things uh, that leap to mind. But now, of course, your SIBO Global Markets, that rebrand is a couple years old now. But moving just beyond the rebrand, the refocus, you guys seem definitely have a shift in focus now. So let's talk about that a little bit. Why now? I was joking about the Canadian depository seats, but all the international things you have going on. What is the driving force? Why now? So really, when you look back over the past three years, especially at SIVA, we've embarked to become the world's largest securities network. So we've landed in different parts of the world, Canada being one of them, uh, Australia, Japan, and of course, we're growing our European presence. So yes, we have our roots in Chicago, and of course, I think our brand is highly associated with SPX and the VIX, but we are substantially uh, more than that today uh, in many different asset classes now operating in the seven of 10 global markets that are very no competition. So we are a very different company today, and I think our global footprint reflects that. I'm looking forward to the uh, CDR report coming out from SIBO Markets. Our listeners will be all over that. But obviously the hot thing everyone's been talking about, I just did the options panel at Stack, what was it, last month, and everyone talked about it there, and all of our listeners, is obviously this, this volume explosion. It's been all over the panels here at uh, FIA this week. Everyone seems to be just uh, in awe of the, the growth rate of, of options volume out there. Obviously from your perspective, you're, you're in the weeds day to day. It's been interesting to watch. Obviously, last year was an explosive growth trend. Uh, If you start digging into the weeds a little bit, start pulling out things like zero day from that mix and look at single stock, maybe not as robust, single stock options more kind of flat. So uh, what are your thoughts on this protracted growth trend we've had? And I was a cynic at first. I thought, you know, 2021, okay, this is going to end. It's going to cool off and plateau. And I kind of faded it all. And then I was proven dramatically wrong. I don't fade it at all anymore. Uh, So I think the sky's the limit. But uh, where do you fall on that question? Everyone's asking, you know, how high can we go? What is the limit if there even is one? Yeah, sustainability is probably the number one question we get asked about the options trajectory. And you're right, last year there was tremendous growth in options on ETFs and even more significant growth in uh, the index option space and a little bit of flatlining growth for single stock options. We've seen a little bit of the single stock options kind of pick up here at the beginning of this year. It's only a couple months of data, so it's not a trend in the making necessarily. But we still continue to see growth in the options on ETFs. And then we can talk about some of the trends that may be driving some of that growth, including the new um, options embedded ETFs that are coming to market en masse. The index options continue to gain popularity and continue to gain traction. And I guess I too uh, thought that maybe we were at a, a, a tipping point in essence of how much growth can we have. Really being down here at FIA Boca, 
has only reinforced the belief that there's so much untapped demand for the access to the index options space. So it comes at a great time as we really broaden our relationship with MSCI and we add the Tuesday, Thursdays, Expiries and the Russell 2000 index options. So we're really riding this trend of growth in our proprietary products. You know, it's funny, you mentioned the Tuesday, Thursdays in the Russell. It's almost two years now, it's gonna come up in April. It's two years since this, call it what you will, revolution, madness, euphoria has gripped the options world. Everyone wants nothing but zero day. You look at SPX now, any given day, half of the volume is expiring that exact same day, which yeah. to me as a former SPX market maker is insane because you used to try to get as far away from expiration as you could and you'd roll and close everything out and now everyone only wants to play there. It's, it's anathema to me, but that's, that's what they want. And so we see it obviously in SPY and the queues, and now you're mentioning uh, the Russell 2000. So everyone's asking us, I will put it to you, what's next with zero day? We know we've kind of hit, at least for the near term, max index, zero day volume. Where can we go next? Or maybe where shouldn't we go next? Where is it not appropriate to expand this, this fixation on zero day liquidity? Yeah. yeah, I think we're still tapping the surface of zero day liquidity in our index options. One of the resounding messages we continue to hear from clients is that they too are investing in the zero DTE space, especially in SPX, uh, for their business growth. So the alignment between our clients' growth uh, objectives and the trajectory we see index options taking seem to be compatible for sure. When you think about a multi-strat hedge fund, for example, we hear they're opening new pods and portfolio managers are being brought in really to focus on zero DTE strategies. Now keep in mind, it's been, as you said, not quite two years in the making since we added the Tuesday, Thursdays in SPX. And for me, trading and systematic strategies, as you know, it takes a lot of data in order to analyze how well a strategy will do in the in this space. So we're just getting to that point where we have almost two years of data to provide uh, hedge funds and systematic traders uh, to be able to really back test their strategies and enter the market. So we're hitting that inflection point of the ability for new entrants to really examine strategies and come into the mix. We waited obviously almost two years before we added Tuesday Thursdays into the rut 2000 and that's very intentional. We have done a lot of analysis about how balanced the flow into SPX zero DTEs were, what is the net impact, what's the net gamma positioning across the different strikes and tenors to make sure that what we were introducing to the market was in fact sustainable and good for the longevity of the product and of the ecosystem. And so only as we've studied what happened in SPX did we feel like the RUT2 was another good instrument that had that liquidity profile that could sustain the zero DTE uh, contracts. And so that's why we added Tuesday, Thursdays. We'll continue to look, for example, over into our MSCI options where we now have the EFA and the EM trading and have been for a few years, but just next week, we'll be listing three new index options products with MSCI, which are the World, the Acqui, and the USA contracts. And so we hope to do what we've done with SPX and, and RUT2, and that is to basically build a nice liquid lit market where people can port their strategies from SPX to RUT to MSCI, depending on which exposures they choose. But that would be the trajectory we see is continuing to add these shorter dated options in index options where the liquidity merits the contract. Some of the, and expanding the contract. some of the, the global indices yes. as well. Yeah, RUT this year, everyone's got small caps on the brain, it seems like these days. So zero the volumes di would suggest that that is true. After we listed Tuesday, Thursdays, we're seeing the nice average daily volume. Zero day small caps is probably going to be going to be fun this year. You know, I know I certainly didn't imagine. I know when you list any new product, you can expect you know crazy bleeding edge of retail to dive in because they always do that. Did you ever imagine in your wildest dreams we'd see so many, you mentioned the funds, and so many funds and institutions coming in to focus almost exclusively on, on the day of expiration and then doing it again. I mean, to me, it was, it was certainly surprising. Were you as surprised as I was? I think it wasn't obviously in our pipeline of things we wanted to bring to the market. It was really through client demand that those got added. So no, I would have to say it wasn't our a product idea. It was from client demand. But now that we have them and we see how investors and traders are using the options, it begins to make a lot of sense about why people are choosing these zero DTE options to trade. A lot of it is the risk rolls off every night. These are cash settled. And so you're not exposed to a physical delivery that exposes you to risk after the fact. 
Um, the tax treatment in these options remains favorable to other instruments potentially. So when you think about it in the rear view mirror type of lens, it makes a lot of sense why people are choosing these contracts to trade systematically and it makes a lot of sense. That's been interesting how contentious they still are too. Obviously the volume is there so people like them. Then you come to a, an industry event like this and you mention zero day to anyone and there's a, it's a coin flip whether they're going to say I love these things, I trade them all the time or this is nothing but institutionalized gambling and it, it's the death of markets as we know it and, and so on and so on. Are you surprised that they're still maybe as, as divisive as they are, especially for this crowd, the industry crowd who seem to be maybe a little bit more reticent uh, on the uptake? I guess I wouldn't necessarily agree that that sentiment is still so All right, divisive. we're going to debate now. Here we go. Now it yeah. gets fun. <laughs> I, will, I will concede that the debate was loud and vocal when we first listed the Tuesday, Thursdays, as people wrapped their head around it. And there was some research paper articles written uh, that called into question exactly that, the safety of these options for the end investor. But as we've also added our voice into that public sphere, and our voice is based on the data that we as the exchange can really only see. Uh, we've been able, I think, pretty successfully to counter the arguments that the zero DTE contracts are dangerous for the market. Mandy Zhu, our head of market intelligence for derivatives, does an excellent job of really diving into how we got to these conclusions and why our thesis remains the same, that this is very balanced and risk capped flow that's coming into the market. And so actually from clients, I asked that question, are you hearing from regulators and so forth, more questions about the zero DTEs? And the, the message I've heard is that those questions have diminished quite a bit, that there's, there's not a lot of uh, investigatory cycles being spent on zero DTEs relative to how much was being spent in the first years of their listing. I think people are getting their head around them more. So, here at the conference, what I've heard are questions like, when do we take zero DTEs to physically settled ah. individual stocks? And those are the ah, kinds of yes. questions that are rising. <clears throat> I was going to get there next. You might as well go there now then, because we're getting that question a lot, as you probably can guess. Hey, we like the zero day SPX, but what else do you got? You know, they want it on their NVIDIAs, they want it on their Teslas and all that, uh, all that fun. So I get it all the time. I will not put it to you. When exactly, specifically, the day, the minute, the time, will we see, let's say, your, your zero day NVIDIA, for example? Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, right now, that's growth at all costs because it's, it's folly to think that the industry is ready to list these kinds of contracts on a physically settled uh, stock. Uh, the, the systems aren't ready. Um, the different broker dealers aren't ready. Uh, we're just not ready as an industry to prudently bring these to life, despite the fact that we all know that they would be a growth engine potentially for the options space. However, we have to look at this and say, what is truly in the best interest of that retail client? Do these actually serve the correct purpose for that retail client? Are we sure we understand the full risks? And are we prepared to handle them? And all those questions need to be debated within the industry and they need to be answered prudently before we would move forward. Because the last thing anybody would want would be for something to systemically happen because we did something as an industry that we weren't all uh, ready for. So eyes wide open on this. You mentioned the physically settled. I've heard some people talk about we need to go the extra step of creating a whole new suite of cash settled options first before we can then get back to what everybody wants, which is the zero day equity options. That seems like a lot of extra steps, but have you been hearing that too? Or yeah, you thoughts? definitely hear that as a, a way to solve this physically settled uh, issue is going to cash settled uh, single names. I would say to that when I talk to you know our clients about this, you know, one of the things they always mention is, well, that is a big educational lift and it could likely induce confusion into the market just when we have this sophistication and growth of knowledge from retail traders to now introduce a cash settled concept that lives side by side, potentially in the option montage and the confusion that that might invite between an investor not knowing was this a cash settled contract or was it physically settled and did I mess that up? And you know, how do we even present that from a user interface perspective to the client in ways that they can understand? So, this is going to be a topic that I think starts to you know, rise and will be hotly debated and contested and the industry will start to digest it slowly and figure out the right path. We don't have the right path today, so it's important that these conversations are happening, but 
um, we can't get ahead of ourselves. I know I don't look forward to the emails of, I sold puts an apple and I didn't get my stock. What happened? I'll, I'll forward them to you guys. After September 10% yes, the next morning, Yes, yes, right? exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, we talked about zero day uh, really quickly since the last time we chatted, which has been a while. You guys have added on the zero day vol front as well. We have a one day VIX now. Uh, walk us through that and what, what are some of the plans for that? Is that it for now? Is it just the abstract one day uh, number? Or is there a product down the road we can look at for one day VIX? Is that the next thing? Yeah, I think the, the, so the, one, the intent of the one day VIX and index that were released last year was really in response to folks trying to understand the zero DTE landscape vis-a-vis the 30-day implied vol that the VIX shows us. And so that was a way to say, well, this is a one-day measurement of implied volatility that better matches the one, two-day, you know, contracts that you're trading. It is not designed as an index that could support a tradable product. So that is really not in our view right now. We really wanted to just bring to market something that helps traders navigate implied volatility through an index indicator at the front end of the curve rather than relying on the 30-day VIX um, as an indicator of very short dated options. Lines up a little more with For their, sure. With their all, where they're all living now, which is uh, the front day. Well, I would say it's not where they're all living because when, when, when we say something like that, that would imply that we do not have the volume sustaining in the outer expiries. But in fact, even though we do see the explosive growth in the short dated, we've seen no cannibalization, interestingly enough, of the outer expiries. We still see the same type of trading and exposures and hedging that people rely on in the outer tenors. So growth for sure in the front end of the of the curve, but it's the same growth in the outer expiries as well. So where half of them are living, how about that? That's that's fair to say. Thank you. <laughs> yes. you of course came to SIBO through LiveVol, a product that was kind of designed for a very specific, very sophisticated audience, you know, market makers. And now before we started a recording, we were talking about just the kind of the retail explosion that's been going on in this options market now and their growing evolution and growing sophistication. I know it's been fascinating for us to watch here on the network, and I'm sure for you now that SIBO has added not just LiveVol, but a bunch of other tech offerings to their suite there. For you, I mean, this was an audience, I know when we first started, do, started doing this, retail was here, Ismail was here, and there was a big chasm in between. And the demand or even understanding for retail to be able to use some of these tools just wasn't really there. And now, you know, fast forward to uh, 2024 and we see people, there's a hunger, there's a demand. They want better analytics. They want this, they want that. And they're willing to use it. They understand it. They're willing to buy it and do whatever else with it. So for you, I mean, coming in from that side of the space, I'm curious for you, uh, what are your thoughts on the evolution of that side of the retail space, the, the sophistication, their need and demand for tools and their willingness to actually go out and seek them out and use them? Yeah, the, what the retail trader has at their fingertips today couldn't be more different from when you started basic options education back in 2013 and LiveVol came to market uh, before 2010. So the sophistication of the retail trader is not from a single source. It's from the aggregation of the many educators you included, Mark, uh, as well as the tools that have come to be democratized for their access. As you mentioned, the Live Vault Pro platform was exclusively used in the beginning by market makers yeah. because it was one of the first platforms that actually showed implied volatility over standardized 30-day, 60-day, 90-day tenors. And it was hugely valuable as a market maker to be able to see that normalization of implied volatility. But now, now that product is used by as many retail traders as market makers were in the beginning, right? And then think about you as an educator and all that you have brought uh, to, the, to the voice, to the conversation. And then you multiply that by the educational efforts that the retail broker dealers themselves have done. And so this is just a resounding course of sophistication of education, uh, even including our Options Institute at SIBO. Continuing that evergreen curriculum that we try to spread across uh, the world for anyone who wants a leg up in really starting to understand options and the different educators uh, that have their own followers that then have grown together. So I think it's just this aggregation of education and tools that the retail trader now has at their fingertips. I'm glad you brought up education. I'll, allow me to rant for two seconds because I came down to this conference this week and everyone's talking about options education, including you guys, which is great. I love that. And uh, you guys have the Institute, which is fantastic. I love to see that. And then you go to a lot of the panels here and everyone's talking about options education. A lot of the other exchanges, shall we say, are talking to other firms. And I, and I look at it and I, wait a minute, you don't have an educator on staff. And it seems like 
the most of the industry has abdicated the education, which they all admitted this week is, is first and foremost, especially with this retail boom. Education, first and foremost. Uh, they, most of them seem to have abdicated that to the retail brokers or to the small team at OIC, which does a great job, but they're a handful of people. They can't do the lift for the entire industry. So yeah, you guys talk about education and you have the institutes. So you actually are one of the few putting your money where your mouth is, which I like to see that. So what can we do to get people moving beyond the talking phase here. We're saying, hey, you know, we own six options exchanges, for example. Maybe we should have one educator who can go out and, and talk about these products to people. It seems like the industry, now that everyone's moved, obviously for-profit public companies, education's just an expense. How do we dial back that mindset to say, it's not an expense, maybe it's an investment in the future? Yeah, I mean, we clearly, I can't talk for other exchanges you or clients. Right now, you are. You're right, <laughs> business models, but that's exactly why we think the Options Institute at SIBO is so important because even though you may say it's a small staff, it is a very talented staff who has a lot of tentacles into other educators, into other broker dealers, into other exchanges and trying to almost like white label our education. So the amplification of the efforts within SIBO are well felt throughout different organizations and the world. And we do look at education as an investment in our options business. It truly is an investment in that because when you educate the trader, when you teach them how to trade options prudently, those are the investors, those are the traders that actually have staying power and the whole industry benefits. And we're happy to have that lift on our shoulders because we do believe and have believed since the inception that education of index traders, index options traders and options traders in general, super important. There actually was a, a large firm, which shall remain nameless, does a lot of options volume. I said on a panel yesterday that they don't do long form options education. They prefer a TikTok snippets, because that's what their audience, that's the, that's the attention span of their audience. So they're doing all of their options educational lift in TikTok length videos. So uh, I guess uh, that's where we are now uh, as an industry. Uh, we talked about a few other products you guys have in the offering. One of the things you guys have cooked up of late, which very much intrigued me, I know it seemed like it's maybe a little bit farther down the road now, was dispersion. It's a cool thing. We talk about that a lot on our ball program. Even going back to sophistication of retail, even they are starting to be intrigued by and well, understand you know. understand the use case for that. I know when you guys first announced it, we talked about it. We had a lot of people writing in saying, hey, what is this? When can we trade it? Uh, I know talking at the briefing yesterday, it sounds like that's been moved down the road next year? Is that the roadmap for the Spurgeon at this point? It, it likely is uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, we have dependency on the OCC, the clearinghouse that clears all U.S. options to make sure that we get the specs to them so they can get this product cleared through their risk systems. And the second reason is, is that, as you can imagine, settling a dispersion futures contract where you're delivering baskets of options, in essence, single stock and index, uh, that's a settlement process that needs a lot of care so I was and a little thinking. Surprised when I saw the announcement, I was like, wow, they're, they're going for it. We've okay. been talking about this for a while, though, <laughs> and we've had uh, many dozens of client meetings when we talk to those that would be most interested in trading dispersion uh, to get their input. So those, this has been an effort that has been underway for a good year and a half and getting client feedback about how to actually bring a product like this to life. And it is a good time for it when you think about you know, the conversations you hear about the VIX being suppressed relative to index levels, et cetera. I think what people are missing is that even though the surface may look flat, what's churning underneath the surface in the index components can be actually quite a different story. And so dispersion, as you know, allows folks to express their view that certain stocks are actually going to outperform. So we're in, a, in an environment where you know, correlation is not uh, one. Uh, and there's actually stock picking and alpha opportunities. And I think dispersion allows people to see what exactly that opportunity uh, may or may be, and then bet against it or for it in a futures contract. I know you're not digital. I'm gonna ask you to put your digital hat on for two seconds here, because obviously Bitcoin just hit 70,000. People are all excited. You launched the margin futures. Bitcoin futures back in January, right around the time of the approval of that. I know you put up the first trade the first day, but catch our listeners up. What's been going on since then? And I know it's probably still a little early to talk about the options, but give us the tease on that front as well. Sure, so I mean, we were a derivatives company. So of course we have options in our line of sight as soon as we can get those listed, but we're really focused on making sure that 
but since we've launched the margin futures, that we're continuing to add the necessary participants, more market makers, more FCMs, getting access to our digital exchange more prevalent. But the, the volumes look good, the notionals look good, we're seeing good traction, and so we're very optimistic that our margin futures are going to continue to, to grow. And then as those actually find their terra firma, we can think about adding the options on, on top of those going forward, and that's certainly on our roadmap. Speaking of Bitcoin options, I know you're not a regulator, but so uh, how people are asking us. Line yes, line. exactly. <laughs> uh, for your sake, I hope not. But a lot of people are asking us, hey, where are the options on the new ETF? So I'll put it to you again, not your main bailiwick, but what are you hearing behind the scenes? What is the holdup on the options on the ETF? So, I mean, the holdup is just the regulators need to get comfortable with listing options uh, on, the, on those spot Bitcoin ETFs. And because the OCC is really the one that has to file with the dual regulators, it's just going to take time for them to review it and then to get comfortable and then ultimately come back with what I think will be an approval, but we don't have any certainty on it. And we definitely don't have any line of sight into how long this might take them. Yeah, we spoil people now. They're used to a hot IPO comes out and they get options within a couple of days. It used yeah. to be weeks or months. It so they, they want that now. They, they want it in their hands. Yeah, so. I think most people in the industry would like to see the options listed. Clearly, you know, we know all the benefits of having options in a portfolio. And when you think about digital assets and sometimes the volatility in those assets, options are a very nice uh, utility to have. It's funny, the regulator can sign off on the underlying, but buying a call on that underlying, that requires many more months of study. I'm not going there with you. <laughs> I'll say it myself. <laughs> it's it's more fun if I say it anyway. Yeah. Well, we touched on a lot of interesting things here on the show, but before we roll out, we'd like to leave our audience wanting more. I'll leave them a little bit of a, a taste, a hint, a tease of what's to come. So you mentioned uh, some of the MSCI products. What else can we look forward to coming down the road from SIBO? So one thing we do think we're going to get released this year are variance futures. Uh, okay. Now we used to list variance that, futures. That's been, uh, that's been an ongoing thing. It has been. You know, if you, if you, you know, go back a few years, we used to have variance futures listed on our futures exchange. And there wasn't a ton of interest at the time and we ended up delisting them. But because clients have come to us in the last, I don't know, 18 months and said, because of the UMR, the new margin, the cleared margin rules, uh, they're more um, advantaged to doing these types okay. of trade in a listed market versus OTC now. And so because of the capital requirements changing, the demand for a listed variance futures contracts has come back to the market. So we are looking for later this year to list variance futures on CF. There you go. You surprised me with something. I didn't know that was coming. So there we go. Variance back on the market out there at SIBO, which is, again, we talked about that a lot in the early days yeah. and uh, not so much lately. So I'm glad we'll have something else to talk about on our Vol show. Well, Kathy, great to have you back on again. We'll have to do it more frequently than however many years it's been since I was going to say, let's not let it be so uh, long. Maybe we'll catch up again at OIC or something. But thanks That's for coming right. on and we'll look forward to all seeing right. how all this unfolds from SIBO in the coming months. See you in Nashville. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.